All right, here are some more multiple choice questions review uh, for neurology, step two, NBME shelf exam. 70 year old male presents to the clinic with a six month history of memory loss. His wife reports that she has noticed patient has become increasingly forgetful. He has managed their finances for 40 years, but over past few months have forgotten to pay bills on time and missed several appointments. So this is very classic amnestic pattern of uh, cognitive impairment or amnesia or forgetfulness. Uh, 70 years of age, more noticeable in wife, affecting their finances and bills. So, so far the history is very classic for uh, amnestic MCI or early um, Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's disease. He recently got lost while driving to their local grocery store, a route which patient has been familiar with for over 30 years. So this is a little and a questionable. Usually, uh, people with Alzheimer's don't have problems finding directions, uh, especially when they're familiar. So this is more of a visuospatial confusion that is more often seen with frontotemporal pattern of dementia or Lewy body pattern of dementia. However, can be seen in Alzheimer's, although should be a rare occurrence and not a common feature. Wife reports patient has uh, seemed to move slower over the same period of time. So that raises some concern for Parkinsonism, but age-related slowing is also not very specific. Patient has past medical history significant for well-controlled hypertension, atrial fibrillation, on the sinopril warfarin. He denies use of tobacco, he said all un unrelated information, but they often fluff uh, step two and step three questions by adding information like that, just like in real life. Patient endorses episodes of urinary incontinence, so that is now concerning, which he attributes to not being able to make it to the bathroom, so which will be urgent continence. So that also now bring into the picture another differential for dementias, which is normal pressure hydrocephalus, but so far. Uh, uh, this urgent continence raises concern for NPH, but this could be related to uh, many of the problems, including prostate in a 70-year-old male. Uh, upon examination, patient is alert with depressed affect, uh, again, unclear the significance so far. He recalls zero out of three after five minutes, so significantly impaired memory. Cranial nerves and extraocular movements are normal. Uh, some psychomotor slowing, so that again relates to depressed affect, has a white base gait and small shuffling steps, so that raises concern for either NPH or Parkinsonism of some sort. Patient has a positive pull test, so that's postural instability. Patient falls backward when pulled from the back without being able to correct themselves. He is not noted to have a tremor, so that is not required for Parkinsonism, but is often uh, given in a question, although in real life it is not always present. Lower extremity deep tendon reflexes are 3 plus bilaterally, so that's hyperreflexy or abnormal, raising concern for upper motor neuron syndrome, and Babinski sign is present bilaterally, so that also raises concern for upper motor neuron syndrome, which raises concern for normal pressure hydrocephalus. So a little bit of Parkinsonism, some amnesia, amnestic pattern, but some also visual special confusion. So, you know, this is, this is very real, like a real life patient. But to be honest, that's not a question for a board exam or, or USMLE, because in USMLE, they try to keep things clean. Uh, and not confused. So in a patient, if this is really an NPH, then you should get not an amnestic pattern of MCI and not a visual spatial dysfunction, but what we call a subcortical dysfunction. There should not be any concerns for depression or psychomotor slowing if this is really NPH and there should not, you know, a wide base gait and shuffling would go with it, as incontinence will go with it, and then you would should have a subcortical pattern dementia and not clearly upper motor neuron sign. So there's, there's a mixture of things. There's Alzheimer pattern here, then there's also NPH pattern, there's Parkinsonism, there's also depression, there's also upper motor neuron syndrome. So there's too much going on. And that often is 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 seen in a real life scenario, a clinical scenario, but it's typically not seen in an exam, even board exam. They try to keep things very clear uh, when testing on multiple choice questions. That's one of the limitations of multiple choice questions that they have to make exam very clear uh, so that to be fair with everyone and not be misleading. Uh, although maybe in open-ended questions, you can have scenario like this. And then you can say, okay, let's discuss what fits with what, what goes along with Alzheimer's, what doesn't go along with Alzheimer's, what goes with Lewy body dementia, what does not go with it, what goes with NPH, and what does not go with it, and so on and so forth. So let's look at the option. Uh, Hyperintense scattered white matter lesions in periventricular region T2 MRI of the brain, that will be nonspecific, uh, is, should not be the uh, diagnostic feature. Minimal cortical atrophy with large ventricles MRI of the brain, that will be for NPH. 
atrophy of the hippocampus and medial temporal lobe MRI of the brain, there will be Alzheimer's and unremarkable MRI brain, but an abnormal sign of the dry, dead skin, there will be Parkinson's disease. So it's definitely not classic Parkinson's because there is dementia, which should not be seen in early Parkinson, and it should not be a normal, uh, and you know, this is so far not classic Alzheimer's, although many Alzheimer's patients have unusual things. So it could still be Alzheimer's, and you have other explanation for depression, other explanation for gait impairment, other explanation for upper motor neuron, such as cervical myelopathy. So in a real life scenario, I would go for Alzheimer's like C, uh, but in uh, an exam scenario, I would think that the patient is likely NPH, which is most of the features, although not all features fit with NPH right now. So I will go with B so far. Yes, so the answer is B. So moving forward. Um, a 44-year-old female comes to the emergency room with a co-worker due to a fainting episode which she experienced while she was at work uh, less than 30 minutes ago. So 44-year-old female comes to the emergency room with a co-worker due to a fainting episode. Uh, a 44-year-old female comes to the emergency room with a co-worker due to a fainting episode that she experienced while she was at work less than 30 minutes ago. The patient says that she was talking to her coworker five hours into her shift and she felt she didn't, she's not right for over an hour and then she had the fainting spell. She was walking to her desk and she suddenly began to have tremors, sweat, feel hard and then suddenly fell to the floor. So some kind of passing out, whether it was a syncope, whether it was um, other reasons for lost consciousness uh, such as uh, vasovagal, such as uh, um, a seizure, could be a TIA, could be... Uh, hypoglycemia, hyponatremia, so many things. The patient was brought to the ambulance, did not remember anything, she got in the emergency, so it lasted a while. That goes against vasovagal. Typical vasovagal, when the blood pressure drop, they fall down, and as soon as they hit the floor, they start coming around, and within a minute, they're back, within, you know, within a few seconds. But this is longer. It took a while for her to recover, which goes less for vasovagal, classic syncope, and more for something else. Uh, upon interview, patient says she has hyperlipidemia, diabetes, and arthritis. So diabetic patients can have hypoglycemia. Um, so it's something to think about. Uh, she's 44. So the question is that it is type 2 diabetes or is it a type 1 diabetes? Type 1 are don't have insulin, so they're more likely to become hypoglycemic. Uh, patient has today, she was running late this morning, rushed to work. She mother has epilepsy, so raises concern for seizures. So curveball may be there but never fainted before. Patient says that she recently had new medicine added to her regimen. So, you know, you have to think about medicine causing something, either a syncope or either causing hypoglycemia. Patient is alert and oriented. Babinski is negative, clean up intact. No localizing signs. Blood pressure is normal. Vitals are normal. What's the most likely cause? So the information is not complete here. So again, this is not a great board exam question or, or USMLE question because the information should be enough for you to make a diagnosis confidently uh, without reading the options. So if this is hypoglycemia, I don't, I don't see evidence yet. If they're not saying which new medication, so that's not clear yet which medication, it may be a medication side effect or not. So it's an incomplete question for the board exam or for USMLE or steps or shelf exam. But in real life, this is what we deal with, right? Uh, Sometimes patients say, oh, I don't remember what new medication I started. I don't have it on me anymore. But options are focal to generalized seizures. No, this is not focal uh, seizure becoming generalized. Generalized seizures should have tonic-clonic, but focal seizures can have with altered consciousness. Um, so you cannot fully rule it out without having clear evidence for something else. Orthostatic hypertension, patients should come back right away. Vasovagal syncope is again orthostatic hypertension, so same thing, not good distractors. There should be uh, obviously different distractors. B and C are the same thing. Uh, but again, as I said, with visual syncope or orthostatic hypertension, patients should come back around immediately after falling to the ground. Medication side effects seems to be the most likely scenario, but we should know which medication. I'm presuming it's something that has caused hypoglycemia. Yeah, so hypoglycemic attack is what the author was writing, but distractors were not great and question was incomplete. <clears throat> So 65-year-old patient presents to the emergency department after becoming unresponsive and experiencing jerking of his right arm. So jerking of an arm makes me think about seizure, becoming unresponsive, but only jerking of the arm doesn't make sense. If it's a generalized seizure, it should be jerking everywhere, but if it's unresponsive with a focal seizure, makes me think of a stroke causing a seizure. 
uh, or a bleed or a tumor or something else. Patient's wife reports the episode lasted one minute and 15 minutes after he returned to baseline. So again, so far fitting with the seizure, but why would he be unresponsive with the focal seizure? So it makes there something else missing. Patient has no known history of previous seizure activity, uh, has had headaches the past several weeks with non-productive cough. So now the story is cooking, right? So headaches for weeks with non-productive cough, so makes me think about meningitis right away. Patient is a former smoker with 45-pack year history. That makes me think of tumor right away. Drinks one to two beers a week, does not use illicit drugs. Patient has not followed up with his primary care for a few years. Something has gone for a while uh, that may be missing, right? Uh, is usually when they say patient has not seen a doctor for a while, that means that something has been cooking for a while. So that makes me think about cancer or tumor or malignancy. Normal vitals, uh, small laceration on the left side of the tongue goes for the seizure. Um, cardiopulmonary auscultation reveals decreased breath sound on the right lower lobe, goes for tumor or infection or pneumonia or something like that. Uh, no abdominal masses, neurologic examination, normal cranial nerves, there's no sensory loss muscle, so nothing focal. There is low sodium. That may be an indication that there is a tumor. Tumor often can cause low sodium or hyponatremia, but hyponatremia itself can cause seizures by that self, but now patient is normal. So a hyponatremic seizure will be patient is still encephalopathic, but patient is not. So what is the next best step in management? So if you're, uh, you know, first question is that what's the diagnosis? And based on this so far, I would say that the diagnosis being suggested is some form of a brain metastatic lesion from a lung cancer. And if that's the reason or concern, then I would probably want to do some imaging first. So I may obtain a brain MRI, but even before MRI, I also do a chest X-ray will be the, my first step in management, right? In, in an ER, I'll just do a chest X-ray. Why there is no lung sounds from the right side and non-productive cough, and then a CT scan of the head may be enough to see the metastases, especially if you do with contrast, before going on to MRI of the brain. So not great distractors, I will say, uh, but overall general sense is the same. Let's see what the answer. Yeah, so metastatic brain disease is is what patient is, is the author trying to get to, uh, but not great distractors, I would say. All right, 30-year-old women comes to the neurology clinic for six months of generalized fatigue, as well as occasional syncopal episodes. So that's not good. Six months of syncope and fatigue, that's unusual in a 30-year-old. No significant past medical history, reports half per pack per day of tobacco for 10 years. Um, you know, maybe that's enough for cancers, maybe not, especially if genetically predisposed. She's 30 years, too young to have a uh, smoking-induced cancer. Patient says that her symptoms have been gradually in onset, getting progressively worse, so something slow process. Um, getting up from seated position is when she feels lightheaded and passes out, so some form of a orthostatic hypotension. Uh, and then she ca comes back around, classic vasovagal syncope. Um, she has some joint pains in her knees and reports her legs feel crampy when she walks long distance. So that's unusual. Uh, she says after some rest, the leg pain goes away. So some form of a claudication or vascular deficiency to her legs will be unusual. Why? Recently, she reports one occasion of transient visual loss in her right eye where a shade slowly covers her right vision in last a minute ago. If you saw my previous video, that's classic for a retinal artery embolism or retinal vein occlusion or something like that, usually artery embolization. So some embolic phenomena, there is claudication, decreased blood vascular blood flow, she's smoker. So she's having some kind of a generalized vasculitis that is causing some vessels involvement, right? Uh, will be my first concern with this kind of a presentation is what the author is trying to tell me. Patient has elevated blood, uh, temperature, although borderline. And blood pressure is normal, uh, sitting and standing. So no orthostatic waves, uh, syncope right now. There are weak radial pulses bilaterally. So some kind of a vasculitis is happening now. Claudication. Mild tenderness to palpation of the right carotid artery with a faint brewy. Again, goes for stenosis of some sort. Again, maybe vasculitis involving large vessel disease uh, or medium, large and medium no papilledema, normal neurological examination, uh, elevated ESR goes for vasculitis, MRI of the head and neck are normal, which is unusual because MRI of the neck means that there is MRA probably being done, but not specifically. So the diagnosis is some kind of a arthritis, so either a giant cell arthritis, which usually involves a vision, uh, or Takayasu, but Takayasu is a medial, uh, medium uh, uh, is a large vessel arthritis, like an arch of aorta. So that is also possible. Vasovagal syncope is clearly going on. So that's not a good distractor. You don't want to put something in the diagnosis, in the options, 
uh, which is an obvious answer. But you have already told me the patient has vasovagal syncope. Then don't say vasovagal syncope is an option because now that is an option. Multiple sclerosis is unlikely. That is not even a believable distractor. So either A or C. If I have to pick something, I would say A because of the eye involvement. But then they say that MRIs are normal, so maybe C which is a large vessel arthritis, like a arch of the aorta, but then there is small vessel involvement of the arms and leg, uh, leg claudication. So let's say A. Let's see what the answer is. C, so Takayasu. So I don't know. I mean, this is a little challenging because giant cell arthritis is a medium vessel arthritis. It does involve the retinal artery uh, itself, while Takayasu is a large vessel arthritis, more of the arch of aorta and carotid disease itself. So there is, you know, there's some things that were not very precisely given, but maybe smoking is more related to Takayasu. Uh, let's see what the explanation is. Large vessel vasculitis, syncopal episode uh, goes with it. So that's true. Amaurosis, I would think about giant cell too. Limb claudication, low-grade fever. Yeah, I guess you could say that it's not GCA, but again, elevated ESR goes for GCA too. I think that some of the information can go either way and may need uh, more clarity. Let's see why it's not GCA. GCA resembles closely Takayasu. Age is a key factor. I'm not sure that's enough of an information to separate out. Uh, the patient does not describe a severe headache in temple radiating pain. That's true, but again, that's not enough to say this is definitely not GCA. You want to put something in the in the question that will tell you that that definitely this is not GCA when you're writing a question for for the board exam. All right, I'll give them. Okay, Takayasu. 36-year-old male presents uh, to the hospital due to severe episode of severe acute headaches around his left eye for the past several days. The pain is the worst pain he has ever felt. Uh, spread slightly from behind his left eye to the left side of the face and lasts around 30 minutes. Headache occurs while he's sleeping. He also reports that he gets rhinorrhea and left eye water. So that's some kind of uh, uh, what we call... Um, the uh, neuro the uh, headaches which have associated uh, with conjunctival tearing, rhinorrhea, and lifetime watering. So there are a group of uh, neuralgias which have uh, headaches associated with unilateral symptoms of conjunctival involvement and unilateral um, involvement of eyes and watering. The differential will be. Uh, Indomethacin responsive headache, you know, sunct and sunna, so S U N C T and S U N N A, and then uh, there's one more, and sometimes cluster headache also fits in the same category. Blood pressure is normal, temperature is normal, patient looks anxious, physical examination normal except for the constricted left pupil. So again, this is a unilateral sympathetic uh, involvement. Um, which of the following therapies is most effective in rapidly improving patient's current condition? So the this is a group of headaches that have involvement of sympathetic system unilaterally. So the group include cluster headaches, endomethacin responsive headaches, uh, SUN, SUNCT, and SUNA. Now, out of the, all of that, the one that classically quickly responds immediately will be the cluster headache, and that's for 100% oxygen. If you have 100% oxygen, the patient is better like that. Uh, so that will be likely what is being tested here. But so far, this could be more than just cluster headache. It could be the sunk sunna and things like that too. And endomethacin, when you have said and said, endomethacin can be an option too. But it doesn't. Endomethacin and endomethacin the responsive headaches or sunk or sunna works, but over days, over two three days, not like first dose. So I would get hundred percent oxygen because of that. Yes, the answer is that. But putting and said in there and the description does still fit with endomethacin responsive headache. Uh, will make it not 100% classic uh, question. Let's see why not and said, uh, not used for cluster headache. Yeah, that's true, but what if it's not a cluster headache, right? All right, so uh, if you want to practice more questions like these, you can go to quizmd.ai, a project of mine that I'm working on, where you can upload any document you want and any information, a blurb or keywords and quickly generated questions to practice on with very good distractors. A lot of these Weaknesses that I point out, we've been trying to eliminate from quizmd.ai. So when it creates questions for you guys, uh, these are much more useful questions uh, in, uh, in QuizMD. Uh, so give it a try.